All right, the audience, we are back on the stream. It is the 11 hour mark. We're going to have our third guest coming up, but let's quickly recap what happened in the previous talk. Aditya, do you think that your job will be taken by an AI or by a robot in the future? Uh, actually, I don't think so, because I'm actually the one making the AI or <laughs> some part of it. Uh, but I think that there are some manual jobs uh, which are repetitive, uh, which consume, which are less efficient, uh, and less efficiently done by, you, by humans. They will mm -hmm. be uh, replaced by AI and robotics. Okay. However, this field will also create more jobs for the ones making the AI. So I think there's a uh, risk. People have to be skilled again, go through different. Uh, pathways just to cope with these changes. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree in general with you, but I also see the news and watch the news that, you know, Google activated their language translation AI and within a few days it developed its own language to communicate with itself that none of the Google technicians um, could actually understand. So, you know, there is this um, situation about AIs kicking off a self-learning process and, you know, getting out of control um, of humans. So there is still this, this aspect of, you know, can we let them run? Yeah. Are we going to have a Skynet in the future? <laughs> <laughs> we, well, never, we, we, we will see. No, of course we don't. We know We hope not. But anyway, um, we go. We move over. Uh, we have already um, Oswald uh, Jumira in in our call. Um, let's say a big hello to Oswald. How are you doing? Hi, hi. I'm doing great. How are you guys keeping? I hope you're having a lot of fun here. Yeah, yeah. It's sure. awesome so far. It's awesome. Okay. Okay. Oswald. What's the situation uh, on on your side? Um, what's the situation regarding the pandemic? How are you how are you coping with it? How is the country coping with it? No, uh, the pandemic has been a, a very interesting period. Uh, I'm actually in Johan, and uh, we are on what is called level two. So the mm -hmm. economy is uh, opening up. Restaurants are open. People can kids can go to school. Some companies have started actually opening up their offices. Uh, however, the South Africa, across the whole of Africa, I think had the highest cases and also the highest number of deaths. However, they had the highest number of recoveries also. And uh, I have a sense and a feeling that uh, the curve has flattened. However, there is need for people to be extra cautious. Uh, but it's been a very interesting time. My job involves a lot of travel. I've not been on a plane for the last five months, which is very rare. Wow. <laughs> but uh, it's been great for my family, though, because I've been home most of the time. But it's been yeah. a very interesting time, I would say. All right, right. I guess, yeah, working yeah. from home and then uh, being able to get the job done uh, remotely, uh, I think is a, it's a great topic to talk about. And if I'm understanding it correctly, you guys are actually assisting startups in order to achieve that and to scale up. So... Tell us yeah. a little bit about your about your session, your talk that's coming up. Okay, uh, so first of all, my, my name is Oswald, right? And uh, I work for Liquid Telecom Group. I think one of my colleagues, Ben Roberts, is actually presented also. And there's another colleague of mine, uh, Winston, who's also going to present. So we are Africa's largest uh, connectivity provider, looking at fixed uh, fiber optic cable across the continent. The whole story of Cape to Cairo, I think you guys heard on Wednesday. And uh, we also are building infrastructure across the continent, data centers, in order for us to actually be able to host different technologies, platforms, and also enable companies to actually work remotely, deploy solutions remotely. And uh, we are actually betting a lot around startups because we believe with the infrastructure that I will showcase in this presentation, uh, that startups are the ones that are really driving innovation, driving growth. And uh, we see this from all parts of Africa. Uh, the world, Silicon Valley, you see this in the UK, Cambridge area, you see this in Shenzhen, you see this in Indonesia, you see this in India, that startups are the engines of some of these economies. And within the African continent, that is our biggest bet on how startups can leverage on the infrastructure we have built to develop digital products 
And when I mean startups, I also mean people coming from a perspective of digital tech skills, developers, uh, in independent software vendors that are developing solutions for corporates. We all out there to support them, make sure we create that conducive environment and also help them to scale through our presence across over 13 markets in Africa. But I'll share that uh, as I present uh, today. Fantastic. Okay. All right, all right. Then um, I would suggest, please, take us through, take us in, 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 into, your, into the depths of your talk and how startups can uh, profit from uh, the infrastructure and services uh, offered by Liquid Telecom, which is luckily also a great partner for this conference. All right, Oswald, the stage is yours. Okay, th thank you very much, guys, for this opportunity and welcome everyone who's listening in. And uh, I, I hope that uh, this uh, couple of minutes, I'm going to take you through a journey uh, of a strategy that we have developed in Liquid over the last three years, uh, born out of uh, some of the opportunities and challenges on our continent. And I would want to bring a bit of context in what it is that we really want to drive on the continent and uh, why we are betting a lot around startups and obviously leveraging on that infrastructure that we have built. Uh, okay, just hold on, I'm trying to move my slides a bit. Okay, cool. So I think uh, everyone in this audience understands what startups are, small, little, small companies, tech-driven companies, passionate individuals, individuals who are out there to challenge the norm, come up with new ideas, build on existing technology, address a problem, be addicted to addressing that problem and offering solutions. So this is a developer conference that we are in, and I do believe a number of individuals in this conference either are working for startups, working for big corporates, working for governments, freelancers, and all of these individuals have a vision around developing, creating a product, leveraging on technology, leveraging also on available skills, and leveraging also existing policies and frameworks across different countries. So some of the challenges that we have seen that affect this segment of startups, these entrepreneurs that we are very passionate about working with, are areas to do obviously with product market fit element. Whatever you're developing, is it addressing a problem? Is it unlocking an opportunity? I'll give an example of some opportunities on our continent. For those people who are creating solutions, either probably maybe in the agriculture sector, digital transformation and introducing technology in the largest industry on the continent, which employs 60% of the continent, $550 billion industry. We need to know that whatever you're developing, is it fitting a need on the continent? Is it about production? Is it about logistics, mechanization? Is it also about uh, the whole idea of demarcation of land, land uh, jurisdictions, which are very much a problem on the continent? in terms of uh, the resettling of people and ownership of land. So product market fit for us is an area where we find many startups are failing to identify that in order to unlock opportunities. The conversation of funding is a conversation that every startup probably that you speak to talks about funding challenges on the continent. So as we're looking at scaling up with our infrastructure and everything, these are the realities these startups face, that funding is a challenge. We have growth in VC investments on the continent, but I think more can be done from private sector, in the private equity, venture capital, markets. Many people talk about Africa being a $1.2 billion market. But the question is, what is that target market that can really consume some of these products that we are developing digitally? There are a number of success stories on our continent today, startups that have scaled. However, we see that many technologies that have been introduced on the continent have been driven by either financial institutions, big banks, and also some smaller startups coming up. Or we see a lot in the mobile telephony space, the technologies that we enjoy on the continent have been brought by telcos who have invested extensively. However, the question of market is very important. Who are you targeting? Is it B2B, B2C? And can you really scale up? are having a challenge in scale up and as you build your products are you building a product for south africa for zimbabwe or you're building a product for africa what does that mean from a data privacy data storage uh cloud computing infrastructure connectivity so all of those are areas that are challenging some of these startups as they build their solutions obviously the softer issues come in very handy in many of these uh, startups that we're seeing issues of mentorship uh, uh issues of uh Having people with experience joining you, having technical expertise is another big challenge. Are we offering the right skills? Is it the right developer tools? 
is it the new uh, technologies, architectures, microservices? Are you using a lot of containerization? Are you using cognitive frameworks on different platforms? Are you leveraging on the cloud? So all of those technical expertise come in very handy. And there is an element of skills development that is very key for some of these startups is they build their solutions and address the challenges. Collaboration is also an area that we see which helps startups scale up. It could be collaboration in skills development, collaboration in funding, collaboration even in working spaces. There's a lot of infrastructure required also by these startups, could be connectivity. How do you run a VPN across multiple countries to deploy your solutions? Where do you host those solutions in the cloud or on-prem? And if it's data centers, do you have access to data centers across the continent where you can actually be able to deploy your solutions? So in summary, these are some of the challenges that motivate us, that way make us wake up every day as we try to find solutions uh, for these startups to build products, great products, scalable products, and also put money in their pockets and drive economic, social, political growth on our continent. So basically, what do we do at Liquid? So I, I had a team in Liquid which... Uh, uh, drives the strategy we have, which we define as innovation partnerships. This is all a strategy which is actually premised on the sustainable development goals and how we drive digital innovation, leveraging on these sustainable development goals and unlocking opportunities that create employment and also that drive entrepreneurship. Many of you guys might have heard about the SDGs. They cut across different industries, could be education, could be actually financial services, could be access to health care, could be access to food security through agriculture. So our thesis is if we can introduce digital technology, encourage startups to develop solutions to target some of those challenges that our continent faces and address these sustainable development goals, will definitely unlock opportunities. So we've been running this program since, and what we look at is how do you leverage on the liquid infrastructure, could be connectivity, could be data centers, could be the cloud, and even the fact that we are in 13 countries. So is that whole idea of co-creation, co-selling, and also being able to carry a startup across multiple markets with the work that we do. And we do believe that the innovation ecosystem in Africa is the one that is going to bring uh, some tectonic shift in some of, to address some of the challenges that we have. And the key areas that we have put together in our package that we look at when we talk about startups is basically looking at how do we pro offer connectivity to the startups? Can we offer it subsidized, discounted, or can we go to those co-creation areas that startups hang out and also be able to offer them that, that, that element of uh, that element of support, and that support then enables them to be able to actually co-create together, jointly work together, and support each other as we scale up. So for us, those are some of the key areas that we are looking at. Another key area we're looking at is actually skills. How do we offer these uh, nascent skills, AI, machine learning, IoT, cloud, game development, through the digital platforms that we have created from an infrastructure perspective, and help these guys scale up? And also with respect to cloud, uh, how do we also then uh, actually enable these guys to actually uh, leverage on the cloud and build solutions on the cloud? Either we provide credits or we provide some technical expertise in developing on the cloud. Funding is an area we look at. Open uh, innovation is what we do as a business where we co-create, co-sell, and scale up. So during this presentation, I'm going to break down all of these areas and showcase to you guys what we have done and what we are doing and also to unlock a debate, a conversation around us to say, is this enough? What more can we do? And how else can we support our startup scale, leveraging on obviously primarily our infrastructure and also from an ecosystem perspective? And you'll also realize that we work a lot with students. We work a lot with software developers, like I mentioned, startups. And also Africa is very much blessed with SMEs that actually want to be digitized. So we work with them as an opportunity to unlock digital transformation and also to scale them up in terms of adopting these technologies. So I just want to show you what Liquid as a business represents from an infrastructure perspective. So within our company, I'll start from the bottom up. So we've built a lot of infrastructure around connectivity, which looks at fixed LTE, Wi-Fi, satellite data, and fiber. So this enables the movement of data across the continent at the continental level. My colleague Ben, I think on Wednesday, shared more about our Cape to Cairo presence, what we have built on the continent. So that is probably the basis of how the whole support for digital companies and startups actually uh, starts from.
Then the next layer looks at data centers. Right now, many African countries are now asking for data sovereignty. When you build a technology in Rwanda, you're supposed to, source, to store the data in Rwanda. And what it means is now you need localized infrastructure where you can actually be able to store your data, run your applications, and deploy within that market. The next layer you look at is the cloud computing layer, obviously, which is now sitting on top of some of this infrastructure where we have got partnerships with Azure, AWS, Google Cloud, where we also offer express services of moving data across the continent efficiently from where you host your workloads and everything, and also being able to build solutions on that cloud. And on top of that, we then also talk about skills. When you have built your solution, do, are you building it with the future in mind? Are you applying AI, AI capabilities, machine learning capabilities? Are you looking at blockchain? Are you looking at big data analytics? So there are a number of skills that now these developers and these startups require so that they can build globally competitive and scalable platforms. And we as Liquid have also developed a marketplace. So this is like an app store where you can then be able to upload uh, your applications, and then we can then distribute and sell them across our markets so that at least you can actually be able to monetize your IP and you can also be able to monetize your idea ideas and scale them up across the continent. We as Liquid have a lot of B2B customers, B2C customers, so we have a lock value for some of the startups as they monetize their ideas. Yes. And those industries that I highlight are topical industries across our continent that actually can require digital solutions and require digital transformation. Agriculture, health tech, we're talking about edutech, fintech, govtech, government applications required, utilities and energy, these are areas where technology is required and manufacturing and logistics. So this whole technology stack, infrastructure stack that we have as liquid is what we are unlocking for some of these startups and corporates and being able to do this at a pan-African level with 18 market presence and expanding is what we believe will scale these startups and put some value into the startups as they scale up. So I'll just take you through what we then call the liquid go cloud program. So this is a startup centric program that actually focuses on raising awareness, adoption, and the usage of cloud services. So what we believe is most of the startups that are being born now are defined as born in the cloud. So they, it, it's rare to see in this day and age a startup which is actually purchasing hardware to create an on-prem data center or, or a small computer room to, to provide um, access to store the data or run their applications. Most of the startups today are building products on the cloud. And as they build products on the cloud, it's important that for those who are at an early stage that we evangelize and educate them about the capabilities of the cloud and what they can build from the cloud. And as they build these solutions from the cloud, we then also make sure that we integrate them into existing ecosystems, either of incubators or accelerators or university networks, where they can also increase their knowledge around how cloud can unlock the opportunity that they're looking for. If you look at when Facebook was created, it was very easy for Mark Zuckerberg to spin out Facebook because he did it in his dorm room. He didn't need a server room, but he just bought capacity on the cloud and then he uploaded his Facebook application and up and running he was. So this is the vision that we have for African startups that with our cloud, our data centers, our connectivity, we can be able to unlock that opportunity. And some of the industries that we look at as a vertical industry approach is obviously media and gaming. We are very passionate about playing games and we believe that they steer creativity and actually is a growing industry. On-demand services have become topical. The Uber type services, the Airbnb type services, all those are uh, tractor, Uberizing tractors, Uberizing trucks. So there's an opportunity for startups to develop tech solutions in that space. Cybersecurity is very topical. We need people who can come up with solutions in that space. Wildlife and the environment, we are blessed with a massive continent, blessed with good flora and fauna across the continent, and we need to be able to preserve it. Technology can play a part. Mobile apps have become very key on our continent. 600 million people have mobile devices, about 200, 300 million, I think, have smartphones, and the number is growing. So the question becomes, how do we then develop solutions that are mobile-based, and then we can be able to address some, quest some challenges on the continent? FinTech, many people are talking about e-commerce, they're talking about payment platforms. How do we enable the development of these applications leveraging on the cloud and scaling up across the continent? Data is the new oil, as they say, it is the oil that is moving. It is the it is the the, the fluidity the fluidity that we see on 
in our network is actually data. So all our network infrastructure nodes move data across different countries, different data centers from the cloud. So that's an area where we need now to say, how do we monetize that data, which is actually visible and present in our infrastructure, either for efficiencies, product development, and any other use cases. IoT is a very topical area today. How do we then build this uh, sensor-based networks all over the continent to actually drive efficiency, build new products? So in this Go Cloud program, what we have done is we have identified over 500 startups across 20 African countries that we are working with. We run a lot of programs together with these startups, competition, hackathons, developer meetups, and we make sure that we capacitate them with skills. They understand our infrastructure. We also help them co-create products. We help them with uh, cloud credits, uh, technical support, GitHub kind of uh, training, and also some GitHub enterprise credits. So there's a lot that we're doing with partners like Microsoft today in order to actually unlock this opportunity at the co across the continent. So this is one area we're very proud of because if you look at the 500 startups, if each startup can employ 10 people, we've created 5,000 jobs. So for us, like I said initially, it's about how do we also address our continental challenges of employment creation, of unlocking economies, creating value for some of these new startups. So as part of Go Cloud, there are some other interventions from an infrastructure perspective that we have looked at. So in Africa, most of the startups, because some of them might not afford to own an office, and maybe they don't have a garage to start from. So they end up coming to these innovation hubs and incubators across the continent. So we work with all, there are over 614 tech incubators, co-working incubator, maker spaces across the continent. And all of these uh, ecosystems are becoming engines of growth and engines that are driving the startup ecosystem. And you can see the growth. This Over the last two, three years, they've grown by probably over 100%. And this is testimony to the fact that we're seeing a growth and demand of uh, in startups across the continent. And it's very important for us to be as corporates, as people in the society to support these ecosystems. And as we support these ecosystems, what becomes very important to our hubs, to hubs of hubs, uh, uh, offering is actually making sure that we support these communities and these ecosystems. So we've been providing discounted liquid connectivity to many of these hubs in different countries we operate. And this has actually enabled these guys also to save uh, from their internet costs, number one. However, create an ecosystem that can then build products while sitting in these innovation hubs. And this is a very important piece to the whole long-term strategy around building those startups and making sure that they can scale up. So we continuously working with startups across the continent and that existing environment, we also leverage on it for running programs, meetups, pitch, pitch events, training programs, because it's a well-known infrastructure that drives uh, innovation and also collaboration. We are not leaving our students behind because one of the things we've realized is there are a number of school dropouts that have gone out there in the world to set up some multi-billion dollar, trillion dollar companies. So universities in our global ecosystem System is where the passion is it kicks off usually, and this is where the big idea is identified by the innovator, the startup founder. So we are actually looking also at driving skills within universities, but we are now looking at what we define as 21st century skills. These are the skills which look at areas like AI, machine learning, blockchain, so that at least these students can leave the university armed enough to go into either employment, entrepreneurship, or any other area of interest that they are looking for. And also research and innovation leveraging on our infrastructure is something that we believe assist in scaling that up. So we are working with a number of universities across the continent where we are actually driving the whole entrepreneurial agenda the whole startup vision and the whole idea of leveraging from our infrastructure to build products. So this is the 21C skills approach that we have. So we are looking, we developed a digital platform where students can actually log in, access different courses and be able to be certified by different partners that we have. So we've worked with Microsoft, we trained over 500 data scientists last year and this was a very interesting setup for us. We are now moving into game development. Some guys are learning DevOps, cybersecurity. So it, it's that whole idea of migrating from brick and mortar into a setup that is digital, very compliant with the COVID environment, and being able to showcase skills development that then drive the startup develop the startup to develop great products, scalable products, and actually be able to 
to monetize it. So from a liquid internal perspective, we have an open innovation strategy. So open innovation talks about how you can partner with an external digital company and as work together with them to co-create, co-sell, and probably scale up and provide core fulfillment. So this whole journey of uh, how we work with startups now, this is where we are now looking at saying they've built their product on our infrastructure. Now they need to make money as a startup. Because at the end of the day, no one wakes up not to create a dollar at the end of the day. So these guys also need to survive and be sustainable. So for us, we offer reseller agreements. They can bring their technology. We resell it to our existing customers. They make a bit of money. We can also do JVs where we come together. We develop a product jointly. We agree revenue share models of how we can actually be able to monetize it. And in some cases, we have considered acquisitions. We have not done any, but we're at the stage where very soon we are going to be actually pumping some cash into some of these startups to see them grow. Because like I highlighted, the VC challenge in Africa is real, and we want to see how we as an entity can also contribute to that. So these are some of the startups that we have worked with and we're working with. Some of them have even co-created a product with us, that liquid and paper product. Zente is actually a Ugandan-based company. They're an e-commerce player. Raptor is big on AI, facial recognition stuff. We're working on some COVID cool applications in that area. Kukua is in the entertainment space, how to fuse education and entertainment. Fuzu is a recruitment platform heavy on AI applications in terms of selection of talent and skills, looking at different data sources. Uh, Shape Health is looking at the health space based out of South Africa. So you can see that we have then even created partnerships with the startups. They leverage on our infrastructure. But the most important thing is we scale them up into revenue generating entities. Because the more revenue they, they make, the more they can in, invest in scaling up and the more they can invest in actually being able to build more products. So we've also struck some partnerships with different funding organizations. In Africa, as of 2018, I think that's when we crossed the $1 billion mark in terms of VC. This year, I think people are targeting between 1.5 and 2 billion. So there's an increase in VC investments on our continent because VCs are very important to scale up startups. You can build the best product, but without proper VC support, you won't go far. So we've been partnering with some of these guys where we identify a startup that we're scaling and that we're supporting infrastructure-wise. Then these guys bring the working capital to scale up the startups. So this is a very important partnership for us because it unlocks that opportunity of scaling up that innovation that these startups work with. So as I come to the end of my presentation now, you realize that for us, it's about this journey is not for us alone. We want to work with different partners across the continent. Our continent is huge. We have deployed infrastructure, but we believe that there are other players that will come in from different industries, different players in different uh, countries that can come together with us so that we build this startup ecosystem and enable these startups to scale. We have provided infrastructure and we are continuously providing infrastructure, but it just does not end on at infrastructure. It also needs a other layers, could be market development, could be mentorship, could be financing. So there's a lot that we can do as a united African front and also drive the conversation of accelerating, scaling our startups in order to create jobs to address the sustainable development goals and also actually put food on the table for a number of individuals on our continent. So guys, uh, my presentation will end here. I welcome a lot of questions that might come from the floor, but I just thought maybe let me stimulate a conversation around how we are looking at scaling startups, how we've worked before, and also get some ideas, collaborations coming from the team. So thank you very much for this time. Great, great, great presentation. Thank you so much, Oswald. Um, yeah, this initiative from um, Cape Town to Cairo, um, that is really, uh, really interesting. And uh, in regards to positioning of Mauritius being a re the remote island on the east side, um, do you see any um, any aspects in, in regards that your efforts to to go across Africa also does a little sidetrack to include a little island on in the east <laughs> so uh, let me this map is just showing the terrestrial connectivity but we actually have links that actually interconnect uh, Mauritius, Madagascar, Seychelles. So there's different partnerships that we enter with other providers where we invest jointly 
in these undersea cables that link some parts of Mauritius and also Madagascar, Seychelles, and other islands. So we already have having presence there. But in this map, I was just showcasing what the terrestrial links that we're looking at. But next time you'll see me, I'll, I'll definitely not forget that. So our headquarters is liquid is actually in Mauritius and London. So we have presence in Mauritius at the moment. That, that's great to know. Yeah. Good. Um, in regards then to um, services and, and uh, opportunities that you are um, going to offer or that you're offering to, to startups, um, what would be, are there certain uh, requirements, some pre that that need to come up with or are there some kind of uh, application procedures that you are expecting from those startups? Um, can you please uh, elaborate a little bit more on that? So from an onboarding process, uh, obviously there's a selection criteria that we use and we've tried to gamify it in some cases. So I'll first of all speak on the criteria that we look at. Number one, we're looking primarily at individuals that are addressing obviously sustainable development goals. Are you talking about agriculture, fintech, entertainment and that kind of stuff, education. So for us, once we understand that, that this is the vision the individual has, we look at the stage of the startup. So if it's, mm -hmm. it's if it's an ideation stage, then we then take that startup and we uh, introduce them to some of our partners who work on incubation and acceleration, right? And also some guys who probably look at how they can help a startup look at ideation. And when it moves to the next stage where they have a proof of concept, they've got a product they now want to develop, or they're now looking at actually building a team around that, then we then look at analyzing and saying, what is it that they require in terms of support? So the whole filtering process looks at the different stages of the startup. The my, most mature startups, there's a package that aligns with what they need. The ones that are probably early, early days, we also make sure that we provide them. The middle guys, we also make sure we give them either cloud credits, technical support, or we also then make sure that we connect them to the ecosystem. So the criteria basically is all centered around the first stage from ideation. Some come when they're already mature, and then we evaluate. And it's, it's, a, it's, it's not like we have a fixed criteria to say we can, we just will not do anything illegal or immoral that we won't do. But the rest of the staff, whatever you're building, we will then provide you the infrastructure. So criteria wise, you're in Africa, you're developing to solve sustainable development goals. And we believe that the product you're developing is scalable and can also create jobs and create economic impact. Then based on that, it's conversations that then happen with our team to actually help shape the idea and scale it up. Cool, awesome. Okay, Adija, anything on your side? Uh, not really much, but I think that uh, laying out the backbone of internet in Africa is a really good, a, a great start. And I hope that, uh, more services, more internet services are provided here in Africa, and most of them right now, a lot of it is geofenced, and we we don't have access to it. But with robust internet, and uh, I think uh, more companies will fav will come here and provide their services, and not keep, just keep them in Europe or America. No. Um, yeah, actually, I think this, this um, geofencing and geo-restrictive situation seems is, is actually a, a pain point, I guess, at the moment. Um, uh, are there any intentions maybe then from, from Liquid Telecom as, a, as an infrastructure provider also then to, to reach out to, to service providers like um, Amazon, um, Apple, Microsoft, Google, uh, to encourage them to to open up their markets um, more into the African continent. Because I mean, if I look uh, on my on my system, um, if I try to access something like YouTube TV or YouTube Music, uh, it just tells me, sorry, your country is not part of that. And right now, it's not clear about what is the actual reason for that if it's just political decision is it eventually a matter of um, infrastructure that is not providing enough bandwidth so is there a possibility that maybe liquid telecom can uh, assist and and improve certain um, service providers 
Uh, thank you very much for that question. You know, one of the things that uh, has happened over the last maybe 10, 15 years is we have seen a, a shift in some of these trends. So these big uh, technology companies are actually increasingly investing in the African continent. We are the new growth frontier for some of these guys. And some of the things that we've also realized is actually that when you look at Microsoft, Microsoft has set up their cloud data centers, hyperscale data centers in South Africa. And we, work, we worked with them to set up that infrastructure on the continent. So in Africa, we now have our own resident cloud instances in Cape Town and in Johannesburg. So that was a huge investment for Microsoft to drive bringing down their infrastructure to the continent. Amazon is on its way to doing the same thing. They've now got a big developer team that is actually based out of Cape Town. I think it recruits, it employs over 2,000 or so people that are actually building Amazon products on the continent. Guys like Netflix are now pushing some of their traffic, use, use, utilizing our infrastructure. Google, Facebook, Akamai, there are so many players that have now started looking at Africa as a big opportunity. So I think the trend is is in the direction that is positive. We are going to see the unlocking of access to some services that probably have been restricted. It could be a matter of regulation. It could be a matter of payment platforms. It could be a matter of maybe resources for them to support. But I do believe that in the next five years, the conversations will definitely be in 24 to 36 months, I think. These conversations will be more about how do we then even scale up? Because access is now getting much and much available. We are now seeing people running Office 365, paying with local currency. They are accessing Netflix, paying with their local credit cards. We are waiting for Netflix to be paid for using mobile money. So all of those are maybe even startup opportunities of how do we integrate Netflix so that I can pay it with my mobile money account. So you find that the infrastructure we've built enables us to have people from outside Africa bringing their products onto the continent. However, let's not just make it a one-way traffic. What is it that we are also building, which is going to the American countries? Why can't we also build our Netflixes from here that push traffic that side? Because we have one-way traffic that only comes downloads from US into Africa. So as entrepreneurs who are attending this conference, that's a call to action to say, let's not just support one-way traffic. Amazon is great, but why can't we build our own stuff that we can also be able to push northwards? So for us, that yeah. infrastructure yeah. is enabling all these guys to come in with their products, push their services to us. We are consuming them. So there's a huge shift that we have seen. And this huge shift has been accelerated by this infrastructure that we have built. Yes, indeed. I mean, the, the, right now, I, I get the feeling that if looking on, on Mauritius is that during the last two, three years, there are more services available, especially then in regards to IPTV. Netflix finally came to Mauritius based on um, the increase of bandwidth that it is possible. Also, we, we see the development that um, edge servers and edge infrastructure is actually placed now on Mauritius. We've seen that um, Cloudflare put their uh, Cloudflare DNS, the 1111 DNS is, is here. Um, there are, I think there are cache servers from Google that are now on the island and there are other services coming. But I have to agree with you that um, right now we are in, in a phase of um, consummation and I would also see the trend that it's also about local production, local content production that is then provided into the rest of the world coming from the African continent, coming from the uh, from the Indian Ocean Islands. And I'm really looking forward to, to see the improvements in regards to the infrastructure, to see the improvements in the corporations with those uh, providers. Um, there is more and more content being streamed out, being provided out of the African continent, whether it is the film industry in Nigeria, whether it is the gaming industry in, in South Africa, or even anybody that is at home producing their podcast, or like us right now, producing a virtual conference that, we can, that can be viewed and attended globally. Yeah. And with that, 
Oswald, uh, Jumari, thank you so much for joining us and uh, giving us this insight onto the infrastructure of Liquid Telecom, the services that you're providing for startups and the procedures about how you are actually supporting startups and how you get them on board in order then to um, improve their businesses, kick off their new ideas and see that there's an overall increase of prosperity on the African continent. Thank you so much and have a great day. Thank you. Thank Same you to you. Much. Enjoy. Have a great day. Enjoy your day. All right. So, Aditya, what was your take out of that? It was a really inter interesting one. I mean, uh, moving Africa to higher internet speeds, bigger bandwidth, and connecting every part of the continent. It's a major milestone for a mm. company like Liquid Telecom. And I hope that we move again and we move up. And like you said, geofencing is not really an issue in the foreseeable future. I'm still waiting Fully. for Spotify. It's been more than yes. <laughs> five, five, six years for Spotify. And I hope that these services move over to Africa and even us, we provide services to the world. Yeah, indeed, because at the moment, if you want to consume these kind of services, there's only one standard answer, VPN. And I mean, why? I mean, this feels like cheating. This is like, you know, mm, pretending to be somewhere else in order then to be able to consume service. And it's absolutely intransparent why there are these uh, limitations and restrictions, uh, for example, for Mauritius. I, I really don't get it, but yeah. it seems to be common practice and we can only hope that it's going to improve in the future. Um, what I liked here with, with, with the Oswald is also that actually he uh, kind of um, showed uh, the next layer um, of services that Liquid Telecom is offering compared to uh, the session that we had on Wednesday by uh, by Ben, which was really completely into the physics of, of the infrastructure and the networks. So, I mean, it was a great addition. And I'm also looking forward, I think we're gonna have then Winston uh, mm -hmm. on the call mm -hmm. at one o'clock. And I'm really looking forward what, what is the next level about what Liquid Telecom as our conference partner is, is actually having in their bags, what they can offer. And with that, I think we, should, we are ready for another break. All right, yeah. audience, please stay tuned. We'll be back. Yeah.